everyone, and welcome to today's North Carolina Botanical Garden virtual lunchbox talk. I'm Lauren Green, Youth Environmental Education Specialist and Interim Public Program Support. Today, we bring you Basil Kmo, who will be who will talk about what we can all do to help trees save the world. We would like to thank our spring 2021 lunchbox talk event host, Sims Preston and Olympia Stone for supporting our spring lunchbox talk series at the dogwood level. Lunchbox talk event hosts provide funds that support program planning for reaching a broad and diverse audience, including support for captioning recorded talks that are made available to the public. David Michaud is my partner in moderation today. He'll be assisting our speaker with polls and Q&A. We are ready to move forward to our presenter introductions. Basil loves trees and soil, wildflowers, insects, bats, fungi, ecosystems, basically all of Earth. He is fully committed to caring for this beautiful planet. He is a tree ecologist, ISA board certified master arborist, Duke graduate, and a wizard of things at leaf and limb. Though trees are his passion and profession, he also loves cultivating flowers in his garden, restoring native meadows, and propagating plants from seed. Some of Basil's favorite pastimes are hanging out with his wife and sons, Brazilian jiu-jitsu, powerlifting, crossfit, hiking, and long distance running. His next favorite things in life are reading, garlic, traveling the world, blazing hot peppers, pickles, and anything from Lucette Grace in downtown Raleigh, in approximately that order. Thank you for joining us, Basil. My pleasure. Thanks so much for having me. I'm uh, really excited to be here today. Thank you all for joining. I know you're busy, so thanks for giving your time. And uh, thanks also to NC Botanical Gardens. This is really fantastic. I love the gardens. I'm there all the time. Um, I buy seeds. I do all the things. So, you know, if you're not already an active member, it's a small fee and you get so many benefits. It's just amazing. And they did not ask me to make a pitch. It's just that I love the gardens. So. Thank you. Um, Cool. All right. Well, today, uh, well, first, let me just tell you a little about who I am. I own a company in Raleigh called Leaf and Limb, and our focus as a company is to care for trees, and we also plant trees. Um, our big purpose is uh, we care for trees because we love our planet. Um, we try to do things in ways that maximize the health of the tree, but also cause as little damage as possible, preferably even benefit uh, the, to the local ecology. It's really important that um, the way we care for trees doesn't create problems for other members of our ecosystems downstream. So that's a little bit about me, a little about leaf and limb. And today, what I want to chat with you about is um, just a couple of things. So first, we're going to start off with some of the big issues that are currently facing us. Uh, that part will be a little depressing, but I promise you it'll get much better from there. Um, from that segment, I want to then talk a little bit about how trees can actually fix some of those issues. And we will also do um, then the final segment, which is going to be things you can actually do in your yard or with your properties or your green spaces to help trees overcome some of these big issues. So with that, I'm going to kick it off here with my PowerPoint. Um, also, my emails here, I'll just go ahead and note that. Feel free to send me emails later after this presentation. I want to start off with just some of the big issues that are facing us, and I'm going to talk a little bit about how trees can help us. And then I'm going to actually get into some practical things that you can do today in your yard, um, in your green spaces, that sort of thing. So uh, I want to kick it off with some of the really big issues. First, we're losing a lot of trees. If you were to count to two seconds, one 1,000, two 1,000, in that time span, we would have lost one football field worth of trees. And that happens every two seconds of every single day of every single month. We're losing a lot of trees. As a matter of fact, if the earth is four and a half billion years old and we scale that down to just 46 years, so we'll pretend for a minute that earth is 46 years old, then we began the industrial revolution one minute ago and in that one minute, we've lost half of the world's forests. Biodiversity is under huge pressure. Within our lifetime, over the last 40 years alone, we've lost the majority of all 
animals, birds, reptiles, fish, you name it. Clean air is a rising issue. We don't have that problem here in North Carolina. And frankly, you know, we're very fortunate in the US not to have this problem very much. But other parts of the world, this is a really big issue. Four to five million just air pollution. Soil, where we grow our food, the natural living skin of the planet, we've lost half of our topsoil in the last 150 years. Especially as human population continues to grow, this is a major issue we've got to think about. I find this one to be extremely troubling. We have 37 aquifers on this planet. NASA monitor, monitors them very closely. And of those 37, most of them are running dry. You think about running out of water. It's a scenario I can't even imagine. We see what happens when we get low on oil, which technically the world can still go without oil. It's not pretty, but we still live. I mean, look at the gas shortage we're having here right now. I mean, it's crazy, right? Imagine if that's a water shortage. I just don't even know what that looks like. It's a big issue to watch. A lot of big hedge funds and other companies buying up aquifers right now. And then finally, we talk about CO2. Um, something that NASA monitors very closely. We've had a 40% rise in CO2 in our atmosphere over the last 200 years. Very big problem. It is a pivotal greenhouse gas. So that was the depressing section of this presentation, but I wanna give you some hope. I wanna talk first a little bit about how trees can actually help with all of these issues. And then we're gonna move into the section where I'm gonna give you tips and tricks. I'll do it without video today. So first we talked about biodiversity. If y'all have read Doug Tallamy's books, you know the role that trees play, especially his newest book, The Nature of Oaks. He literally writes an entire book about how an oak tree feeds hundreds of species of caterpillar, houses so many insects and bees and bats and possums and, and the acorns feed deer and raccoons. It's just on and on and on. I mean, you look at the oak tree, and it's literally a grocery store and an apartment complex all in one. And then if you start expanding that out across all of our forests and jungles, this is where biodiversity lives. As a matter of fact, 80% of terrestrial life live in forests and jungles. So if we can get more trees, we can help alleviate this issue. We talked about clean air. Well, trees are the original air filter. This is what they do. This is part of the design. Um, to illustrate this, uh, University of Washington did a study a few years ago. They looked at 55 cities. They wanted to see how trees in those cities, and these were just city trees, street trees, how they pulled down pollution. And they measured the outcome, and they found that 711,000 metric tons of pollution were being pulled down per year in these 55 cities. That number it means absolutely nothing to me. So I took the liberty of converting this into blue whales. Um, that is actually 4,000 blue whales of pollution per year from these street trees in 55 cities. It's pretty impressive. We talk about um, soil. So trees build soil. It's part of what they do. When they convert sunlight, they actually create these exudates that they feed underground. And you've got bacteria and fungi that eat these exudates. And then all these in, uh, creatures eat the bacteria and fungi and creatures eat those creatures and so on and so forth. And that living network underground, that is, that is topsoil. That's, the, that's living topsoil. That's the difference between grabbing a handful of dead dirt and grabbing a handful of dark, loamy, living soil. Trees build soil, and they also help keep it in place. Um, we have a lot of flooding issues here these days, here in Raleigh especially. If you were to take an acre of parking lot, it releases about 27,000 gallons of water per inch of rain, so just tons of water coming off. You take that same acre and you fill it with trees or shrubs or grass, you know, all these things, less than a thousand gallons of water will leave that acre. So when you start looking at all the neighborhoods we're building and the construct and the, the shopping centers and everything else, you know, 45,000 acres per year are being cleared in North Carolina. You start doing the math on this and you start getting into tens and hundreds of millions of gallons of water runoff. And it's, it's taking away our topsoils, it's destroying our stream beds, it's doing all these things. If we had trees in place, we can 
hold that steady. So trees not only create topsoil, they help keep it held steady. And as that water is, is held in place, it percolates down and it gets filtered and it starts filling our aquifers. So we wanna pull the water down. I was shocked to learn that here in the US, the majority of all of our drinking water comes from forests. They're the big mechanism for stopping rain and pulling it down into our aquifers. So if we can get more trees in place, we can also start to address the water issue. Finally, we talk about CO2. This is a big one. Well, y'all, I mean, trees, this is what they do. They, this is their original, they, they are straws that literally just suck CO2 from the sky and pump it into the ground. And that action of moving CO2 from this gaseous, volatile state in the atmosphere through the tree into the soil that, where it's held stable, that is the backbone for how all of life even came to be on this planet. It is the foundation for our ecosystems. So we talk a lot about, oh, we need technology to pull down CO2. Well, I mean, trees are 450 million years of research and development in the making. There's nothing that we are ever going to create that even comes close to the power that trees have for solving this particular issue. And if we solve this issue of CO2, we also simultaneously start addressing other issues, the soil, the water, the biodiversity. We can solve six, seven major issues all at once with the help of trees. I also wanna be careful to make a disclaimer here. It's not the only solution. We can't just rely on trees. We need lots and lots of solutions for all of these problems. But I would suggest that trees should and can be a cornerstone for any of these plans. Um, one of the questions I get a lot, and this is why I want to address this right now, is well, where, where do we put all those trees? Crowther Lab, a few years ago, this is a group out of Zurich. They did a present, uh, study of the planet, and they found 2 billion acres that are not being used where we could actually plant trees. And by planting those 2 billion acres, we could capture 2 thirds of all CO2 we've released and start getting to those other topics we've talked about. I'm moving quick because we lost time in the beginning, but I do wanna pause and just ask uh, for your questions if you have any, and then we'll get to our final segment, which is things you can actually do in your yard today. Yeah, no new um, questions let's see have if we come have in. Any questions. Yeah, none at this okay. point. Uh, there's one clarification about um, the near nativeness of the bur oak. Um, okay. It is getting into the northwest corner of Virginia and would probably grow in mountain floodplains with no problem. Uh, Piedmont summers Perfect. would likely stress it. It's this one of our tour leaders um, has offered this advice. Perfect. That's great clarification. All righty. Well, let's keep going. And y'all, I, again, I know I keep saying this, but uh, one of the fun parts about my presentation is all the videos that I do, uh, and I won't be able to do those, um, but we're still going to have fun. So let's go through some stuff here. Uh, number one, if we're going to plant a tree, we need to make sure that it's suited to grow in that location. I want to show you a photo, which I actually can show you because this is low bandwidth. Um, this is downtown Raleigh. This is a city market. This is a beautiful old willow oak growing in this teeny tiny space. This was probably not the right tree for this space. Should have thought about something maybe a little smaller. Um, I want to plant as many trees as we can, but we do need to be careful about what we plant where. So I would encourage you look at how much space it needs when it grows up, how much rooting space will it need, some of those sort of basic things before you actually select your tree. Number two, when you do plant a tree, you want to make sure you don't bury the base of the root collar. Um, the way I describe the root collar, it's sort of a technical term, I guess, but it's basically the trunk goes down and then it disappears and it turns into roots. That transition zone, that is your root collar. The common ways it is buried is either the tree is planted too deep probably no fault of yours if you do this because when you buy nursery stock it's usually already buried so you actually have to take the time to unbury the root collar and then make sure that when you plant it it's at or above grade 
The other way this happens quite often is this photo here. This is called a mulch volcano. This is really common. We see these everywhere in the landscape. Mulch is great for a tree, but not like this. If you're gonna do mulching, which I encourage, spread it out, go out as far as you can, but just keep it off the trunk. So the, the, the goal post here, the thing we're trying to achieve is, can you see the transition zone from trunk to roots? If you cannot see it, your tree will die. It might take time, but it will die before it should have. If you can see it, fantastic. If you need help excavating that root collar, please uh, let me know. This is something we can help you with. I can send you some how-to videos, or if it's really complicated, it might be something where you just hire a professional like Leaf and Limb. And actually on that note, I don't know if this was cut off because I was uh, so absorbed with talking, but I do wanna give you my email. Uh, David, if you're able to put that out in the chat, it's basil.commu at leaflimb.com. And I'd love for you to email me questions if you have uh, anything after the presentation is done. Maybe you didn't get to, to ask a question you would have liked to ask. Shoot me an email. I'd love to help. It's basil.commu at leaflimb.com. All right, here's the discussion of native. Uh, really important that we consider planting natives when we're planting. Again, I think I'm probably preaching to the choir here. Um, you probably know this already, but the, the difference is that like consider a Japanese maple. It's a beautiful tree. We all love Japanese maples. Japanese maple only feeds a handful of insects. You compare that to say the oak. The oak is feeding hundreds, if not thousands of insects and vertebrates. So if we start mapping out the ecological value of a Japanese maple versus an oak, the Diagrams are very different. The Japanese maple is only gonna have a few loops off of it. So not a whole lot of ecosystem services. The oak's gonna have thousands upon thousands of loops. It's just, an, especially given the biodiversity issue that I described to you earlier, gotta be thinking native for everything. And if not native, go near native. That, you know, the Kentucky coffee tree is a good example. It's not really native here in North Carolina, but they're native one state over. So. You can't, you know, that's gonna be better than say the crepe myrtle. For this, I wanna show you a website, low bandwidth so we can do it. Um, one, on our site, we've got a couple of articles uh, listing our favorite native trees. Our website is leaflimb.com. And then if you go here to articles, there's all kinds of great stuff. Um, so we've got a couple different articles, lists of trees we like. But then I also recommend this. This is the native plant finder. Um, I would push this out on chat if I could, but I don't have access to that. I don't think, no, I don't. Um, but it's NWF, short for National Wildlife Federation.org. And you can search for their native plant finder. This is a collaboration between NWF and Doug Tallamy. You just punch in your zip code and you'll get all kinds of flowers and shrubs and trees that are good for your area. And David posted that in the chat for us. Oh, awesome. Perfect. All right. Um, why does this matter? We're going to go to the big picture repeatedly. Well, well, I guess three times to be precise. But the big picture here is, I, I said earlier, trees can help us solve issues. We need to plant lots and lots and lots of trees, and we do. Well, we need to be intentional about what we plant. We've got to make sure that whatever we plant is done so properly and that it's going to serve the needs of its local ecosystem. If we plant 2 billion acres of Japanese maple, it's probably not going to fix the issues that we're hoping to fix. So we've got to be intentional about what we plant and how we plant it. All right, number four, arborist wood chips. I can show you a photo here. Uh, this is a, a pile of wood chips. And this is the stuff that any tree service generates when they prune branches and they chip the branches, which is what we do. And some tree services also cut down trees and they'll chip the whole tree. Um, the end result is the same. It's a pile of wood chips. These are really amazing because they actually contain a lot more of the nutrients and the aminos and the enzymes that are healthy for building the health of your tree. If you buy mulch from the store, it's just a more sterile product. You're not getting all those benefits that you're gonna get from wood chips. And wood chips are free. Any tree service will give them away for free. 
There's a site called chipdrop.com. Uh, if you want to put that in the chat, it's chipdrop.com and you can sign up and you can get a load of wood chips for free. Also, David, I realize as I'm doing this, I can't show the videos, but I can at least highlight the ones I would have shown. Um, so I'll go back on the, I've got, I've got some, a video here called five ways to accidentally kill your trees when planting. If you're able to get on our YouTube channel and put these links out for the audience, that would be awesome. If not, I'll send you a stack of links later that you can distribute. That would be great. We'll send out those links in a follow-up email um, okay. as well as we have linked your, your website in the chat and we'll do that again. Yeah, I'll, 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 I'll compile some links for later. There's a lot of great video here that I would have liked to have shown, um, but, but we can still send it to you later. All we right. We also have yeah. a question relevant to mulch uh, in the yeah. chat. Um, is there a way to rescue a tree if its root collar has been buried? Yes, definitely. Um, if it's bad, what we do is we have these air tools that we use and the air tools allow us to open it up without harming the tree. You know, if I was to use a shovel, it's going to hack it to part the pieces. So you can't do that. But using these air tools, we open it up and then we make very careful cuts with pruning tools and we're able to, to peel it all back. So yes, it can be done. Um, if the tree has been recently planted, you don't need an expert. Just use your hands and dig and dig away the dirt and the mulch. Uh, but for anything that's established, you know, call us. We can we can talk you through it or help give you a free quote. That was the video. I, wanted, I had a video actually on that topic. But anyway, leave the leaves. This is so important, y'all. If you walk in the forest, you're going to see lots of leaves on the ground. This is sort of a really important part of nature. It's called nutrient cycling. And in a nutshell, what's happening is the trees are feeding the soil so that the soil can feed the trees. It's just a cycle that goes round and round and round and round. And what's really cool is the cycle is fueled by the sun. So as long as the sun's shining, the cycle keeps going and carbon accumulates, it'll grow. And the more carbon that accumulates in the soil, the more life flourishes. There's this really interesting, this almost, it's almost an equation, which is just the more stable carbon we have in the soil, the more life flourishes. So when your trees drop their leaves every year, they're giving you the best fertilizer on the planet. This is the stuff that your trees love. Leave the leaves. If you don't like how it looks, or maybe you're not allowed to leave them for whatever reasons, there's all kinds of tricks you can do. Like you can top dress the leaves. I've got folks who live in HOAs and they can't leave the leaves. You know, there's bylaws, but what they do is they move the mulch rings out of the way, put the leaves under, put the mulch back on top, or better yet, just stack your leaves on your wood chips and then put a fresh layer of wood chips on top. There's all kinds of little tricks you can do to keep your leaves and meet aesthetic requirements if you have to. Um, also going back to Doug Tallamy in his newest book, he talks a lot about how um, a lot, lot of our butterflies and moths and different things overwinter in leaf duff. So not only are you generating the most beneficial fertilizer on the planet for your trees, but you're also helping increase biodiversity. Um, my, yeah, we'll leave it at that because we're running short on time here. So uh, this whole segment that we're in now, numbers four through seven are all about soil. So you wanna think twice before you use traditional chemical fertilizers. I am just gonna go out on a limb and say just about anything you can buy at Lowe's, Home Depot, Ace, Amazon, you just don't use it. It's, it's long-term pain for short-term gain. And the long-term pain is much worse than the short-term gain. Not only is it gonna hurt your trees, and I'm happy to go into some of the reasons why, um, but there's also all the other residual stuff. We've got just tons of fertilizer runoff. Go for a walk in Umstead sometime. Every single one of those creeks have thick algae growing and it's the runoff from all of the nearby neighborhoods. We've got all kinds of ecological damage happening. And then that's the downstream. If you look upstream at production, I mean, I, let me blow your mind. When a company manufactures these fertilizers, it's nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. When producing phosphorus, for every ton of phosphorus that a company produces, they produce four tons of radioactive waste that has to go to either Yucca Mountain 
or one of our ice caps to get buried in the ice. It is bad news. And this is true for nitrogen. These fertilizers are from top to bottom, from upstream to downstream to the health of your tree, bad ideas. Use the leaves, make your own compost, make compost teas, wood chips. These are normal natural systems that work really well and they're gonna save you money. All right, final piece in the soil segment here. Um, soil is, is the unspoken hero. I mean, when you're getting into tree care, some, some days at Leaf and Limb, we're not sure if we're tree experts or if we're soil experts because the two are so inseparable. It is, soil health is the foundation for tree health. And if you wanna know soil health in a nutshell, it's, you need lots of rotting stuff, wood chips, leaves, sticks, you name it. Let the stuff rot around your trees. It's gonna feed your trees. You're gonna get really healthy soil. It's true for your flowers, it's true for lots of things. Just look to nature, see how nature does it. We can make this a more complicated conversation, but unless you're a professional farmer trying to do regenerative farming practices, there's no reason to make this conversation any more complicated. Don't buy all the bunk about fertilizers and all the other rest of it. It's just, it's this simple, do what nature does. I'm gonna make the big picture here and then I'll take questions on this one. Um, soil and tree health, they're inseparable. If we're talking about fixing soil, topsoil for filling aquifers, if we're healing biodiversity, if we're restoring the health of the planet, then invariably we're looking at soil health in addition to tree health. So yes, we need to plant trees and yes, we need to care for trees. And yes, we need to think a lot about our soil. I wanna pause there for questions. I saw some come in, I think. Yep, one did come in. Um, where do you think the roots are for big trees in the middle of town surrounded by cement and asphalt? I guess I'll add on to that. Are there any challenges to growing trees in city centers? Definitely. There's so much we could talk about here. Um, the really old trees in the really old parts of town, they probably are, those roots are probably in three or four different yards. Um, you know, in, in a healthy setting, the tree's root system goes out two or three times further than the edge of the canopy. Uh, urban settings are really tough for a tree. I think if you're planting one afterwards, especially in say like a devil strip, you know, these tight little pockets of land between road and sidewalk, or then you do really have to think about a species with smaller root systems. Um, we have a lot of native trees that are small. You might also, if you're really fancy or you have lots of money or it's a really expensive project, there's all kinds of things you can do to give trees underground rooting space underneath hardscapes. Like for example, downtown Raleigh, all of Fayetteville Street, which is the main drag through downtown Raleigh, there are huge underground chambers there where they built these massive boxes underground, filled them with soil. So even though it looks like the trees are growing um, in, in these tiny little wells, they actually have these huge underground reservoirs of soil. Not super healthy for the tree, but definitely better than growing in a small little box. If you have more specific questions on that, I'm happy to answer. There's so much we could talk about with roots. Sure. Well, here's one. Um, if piling sticks in tree circles, does one need to avoid piling on exposed roots? No. Leaves and sticks aren't going to be a problem. It's really when you're burying it with dirt and mulch. That's the stuff to worry about. The stuff that's going to stay there and keep it wet doesn't want to stay wet. It starts rotting. And actually, it's more complicated than rotting. But layman's terms, it starts rotting. And speaking of sticks, y'all, uh, I love brush piles. They host so many beneficial insects. You'll get free pest control. Find a little corner on your yard to make a brush pile. Beetles love to live there. So many benefits to having a brush pile. Also a relevant question, when putting compost on a tree, where's the best area around the trunk to spread that compost? Anywhere in the root zone. And again, a normal tree, if you walk out to the edge of the canopy and you look at the distance from where you're standing to the trunk, roots are probably going two to three times further than that. They go very far out. So anywhere under the canopy is fair game. You can go beyond the canopy if you want, but anywhere underneath the canopy is a great spot. 
Awesome, thank you for those answers. Um, no more questions at this time, but we have a few more minutes if anyone has last minute questions to ask for Basil. Yep, I'm gonna rush here and uh, talk a little about pruning quickly. So on pruning, two very important points. One, uh, you can't just cut a tree anywhere. It has to be made in a very color. Um, I have a diagram for that that I'll show you. And uh, you know, this is sort of some technical looking stuff, but if you cut in the wrong spot, you will create a cavity in your tree. It can't heal in certain spots. So just be careful. Um, I recommend looking this up. It's called Proper Pruning Principles from Arbor Day Foundation. So I'll tell you exactly where to prune a tree. And when pruning, I would suggest uh, thinking about structure. Structure is really important. When we have trees growing in the urban space, they're getting way more sunlight than they should be getting. When they're in the forest, you've got lots of trees competing for sunlight. So they grow up straight and tall and they have these thick central trunks with well-spaced branches. If you just walk out and you look in the woods, look at the difference between trees in the forest and trees in our urban spaces. The difference is access to sunlight. So what we have to do as caretakers of trees is we've got to train those urban trees not to have so many big overextended branches. Otherwise they could split and we don't want that. Why? Because we need lots of trees to fix big environmental issues. If we can keep them living as long as possible and keep them safe, this is ideal. We really, structural printing especially matters a lot. I'm gonna go through the rest of this uh, just for sake of time. We talked a little bit about fertilizers earlier, pesticides, same thing. Um, I could talk for a whole presentation just about pesticides, but long story short, anything that's, you know, your, your broad spectrum stuff, seven dust is a great example. Uh, any imidacloprid, any of these broad spectrum fertilizers, they're, they're little nuclear bombs in the ecosystem. They're killing everything, mosquito sprays, God forbid, Do, you know, the, the mosquito sprays are a neurotoxin, very, very dangerous for humans also. Just, you just, all of these things create a lot more damage than they're worth. So if you're gonna control a pest, you wanna be finding the most natural means possible. So for example, uh, finding insects that eat the, the bug you want to get gone or sticky traps or neem oil are uh, really, fantastic alternatives out there. Um, we've spent two or three years doing research on alternatives and we've come up with a litany of great alternatives for most every pest issue in the landscape. So you can control pests, but you can do it in a way that doesn't create catastrophe for the rest of your ecosystem. And then, you know, let the insects eat. They've got to eat too. We call certain insects pests, uh, mainly because they're eating the, the flowers or the trees that we love, and that's fair. But at the end of the day, they're just insects and they've got to eat too. So as long as they're not overwhelming the health of your plants, let them eat. Um, if it's less than 20% damage, your plant's going to be fine. Let them eat. It's, it's normal. We're not going to have trees with no damage. We don't want that, frankly. It means all of our bugs are gone. We need the insects. They are every single food pyramid on the planet, at least on land, starts with insects. So we've got to have insects that are very also a huge part of pollination and, and boy, are they in trouble right now. I'll direct you to this, this uh, article to read later if you want. Um, it's called, uh, it's from New York Times and for some reason I can't get, okay. This came out last year, I believe. It's called The Insect Apocalypse Is Here. And um, there's a little pop-up here that's getting in the way, but check this out. Uh, New York Times, 2018, the insect apocalypse is here. It's, it's a revealing look at how endangered our insect populations are right now. My final tip for you, when in doubt, look to nature. This is all out there for us to see. It's in the forests, it's in the fields, it's in the nat natural spaces. We can see what nature does, it's right in front of us. If we simply do the things that are tried and true for millennia, I feel optimistic that we can help alleviate some of these big issues. We need to plant trees, we need to care for the trees we have responsibly, and we need to be diligent about why and how we're doing all of these things. 
Yeah, and speaking of the conservation issue, y'all, one of the things I love, and this was mentioned in my bio, I'm a uh, ecological restoration. You know, I'm a gardener also, in addition to being a tree professional, but my one of my big hobbies is gardening. In particular, I love trying to restore natural ecology. And one of the things I love about the botanical gardens is they are a seed keeper of, of critical importance. They are out collecting rare species, seeds from ecoregions where maybe it's the only ecoregion that has these. And even more broadly, they're very conscious about collecting seeds from within, within North Carolina and some of our very specialized ecosystems. The work that NC Botanical Garden does is hugely important to preserving biodiversity, to healing the planet. And again, they've not asked me to say anything. I'm just a very, very big fan of what they do. So definitely join, it's worth it. If you wanna learn more, our site, there's so much to learn. Um, you can email me, basil.commu at leaflim.com. If you like Instagram, Leaf and Limb has a channel and I have a channel, you can follow both of us. We do Facebook, YouTube is so many great videos. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Basil, we really appreciate it.